Welcome to Bicom's weekly podcast. Um, this is Bicom CEO James Serene. I'm delighted to be actually in the Jerusalem home of journalist and uh, BB biographer, uh, Mr. Anshul Pfeffer. Thank you for having me, Anshul. Thank you for being here, James. It's, it's a pleasure. Um, so I'm really taking this time with Anshul to um, take stock of where we are on this very bizarre second Israeli election campaign of the year. Um, and if I could start off, Anshul, just by asking you, uh, you wrote a... Uh, a, a, a piece recently uh, where you were talking about how Avigdor Lieberman was sort of potentially changing the game for this next election campaign. And he'd done something that hadn't really been successfully done before, is that in a way, if I can sort of describe it, he's toxified the relationship which has been going for around a decade where Bibi Netanyahu's coalitions have always had the support of the ultra-Orthodox parties. And that's been quite a cost-free alliance in terms of his own popular view of Bibi. So how would you typify that, what Lieberman actually did and whether it will actually last for the next few months? Well, with Lieberman, you have to first of all talk about what his aim is. And his aim has always been, if you look at his last 30 years in Israeli politics, has been to try and be as close as possible to power and to be basically a kingmaker. He doesn't, I think, believe that he can be the prime minister, but I think he he he, or, he always is trying to position himself as the man who's got the power over the prime minister or the man who has the power to almost to appoint the prime minister. And since Israel is, uh, you know, it has a coalition government, then the jigsaw puzzle is is one where even small pieces have, uh, have, have a lot of leverage. And Lieberman is trying to use that leverage in a way which will put him in the most powerful position. And one thing that's disturbed that, for, one thing that's made it much more difficult for him in recent years is what you said, this alliance between Netanyahu and the orthodox parties. And we sort of have this idea that orthodox parties are naturally of the right. But if you're looking back over decades and decades of Israeli politics, that wasn't always the case. The orthodox parties never said they're right wing. They still don't say they're right wing. And they manoeuvred between the centre left and Likud, and basically selling their their seats to in an auction to whoever give given the, the highest price, both in both in in subsidies and benefits and and mm. and, and, and funds for for their education uh, systems and uh, whoever would move legislation in ways which which are important for the ultra orthodox parties. And Netanyahu has managed to change that and to put them in an ironclad alliance with uh, with uh, with them. And you have both leaders of Shas and United Torah Judaism saying even before the election, which they never did in the past, that they will support Netanyahu after the election mm. because they have such a strong relationship because Netanyahu puts himself a, a very secular, some people would even say a, an atheist, still willing to give them almost whatever they want because the thing I was never really sh- had much interest in the state and religion so issue. What, so what's changed now? What, 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 what position are we now in vis-a-vis how the ultra-Orthodox are viewed by, by, by Israeli voters? Well, the ultra-Orthodox have never been very popular amongst mm. non-Haredi Israelis, even on the right wing, and, and this is backed up by, by surveys. They are, not, they are not a popular part of Israeli society. But the right wing have always felt that the most important thing is to, is to hold on to power, not let a centre of government in, which may lead to another Oslo process, to any kind of retreat from uh, uh, from the West Bank or from or from the territories. And for, uh, they were willing to swallow this alliance, mm. and you could argue also the centre left were willing to have an alliance and to give up other things for, uh, with the Haredi community, but also. The Haredi community, at least the rank and file, has gone right. Whereas so for the rabbis, it's also for the rabbis who run or lead that community. It's also been very convenient to have a partner in Netanyahu because that way they don't have to sort of confront their followers who would have been less happy if they joined a centre left uh, coalition. And Lieberman, knowing that this is still not a popular thing amongst the right wingers and certainly among the more soft right wing who tend to be less religious than the, than the hardcore of the right wing and are closer to Israeli centrists and therefore sort of this like very amorphous group in the in, in the middle of Israeli politics who could vote for a centre party like uh, Yeshatid or Blue and White or even Labour under certain leaderships that's where 
you know, that, that's where the ultra orthodox are, are, are least popular. And Lieberman is latching on to that and sort of bringing it back into the right wing. And we used to have historically very secular parties within the right wing. We used to have Tomet right. until 1986, which was a very right wing party, but also very secular, very against what they called, and so they still call religious coercion. And even Likud in its early days, in the, back in the 50s, before it sort of evolved into this traditional party that it is today, had quite a, f- quite a few very secular figures within it who was, was a, you know, were strangely against working with, with the ultra orthodox. So you know, that sort of changed over the years, but there still is that element within the Israeli right wing. Mm. And Lieber now wants to personify it for his own reasons. Lieber had no problem cooperating with the Haredim over the years. Ari Day was his closest political ally for many years, Ari Day, the leader of Shas. Uh, but now he sees this chink in Netanyahu's armour and he thinks that Netanyahu's days are numbered anyway, his political career days at least are, are numbered and this is, his, this is his way to try and drive a wedge within the right wing and carve out a different kind of coalition which he'll, he will sort of be in charge of the balance of power. So how do we interpret this? Because you know, on the one hand, uh, we had a situation where just after the second election was called, um, it seemed like when there was stories that Bezalel Smotrich and others were saying that they wanted uh, Israel to be run according to Torah law, and there were rumours that ultra-Orthodox parties had asked for there to be more segregation at public events. Uh, All this was sort of stuff being briefed out to the media. And you had a very interesting situation where you seem to have Lieberman and Gantz and Meretz all saying the same thing, and Lapid, by the way, uh, saying the same thing about, you know, wanting to draw a dividing line on religion and state. So, but on the other hand, we're hearing stories that Gantz has been reaching out to the ultra-Orthodox parties. So, so is this all just gamesmanship ahead of the next election, or is there something big going on here? Well, I think that there, there is an element of gamesmanship, but there's also sort of a revert to the norm, because at the end of the day, 70% of Israelis do not want uh, rabbis or religious influence on democracy. And this includes quite a lot of traditional Israelis who may, some of them may keep Shabbat, or they all keep kosher, and they don't, they don't consider themselves as very secular, but at the same time, they much prefer that things will be run on, on democratic lines and not and without too much influence from ultra-Orthodox rabbis. So there is quite a wide consensus about this in Israel. However, this has never been at the top of the agenda. If you ask, you know, if you ask Israelis and surveys which have, which have done this, what are their top issues? The top issue will always be security, mm. and then it will be the economy, and then it will be social affairs, education. And usually state and religion comes up number four or five on the list. So this, ha- this hasn't been... Uh, it, it's been an issue for, for relatively small special interest parties. We, we had Yesh Atid, which was quite a secularist party before that. We had Shinu, which is even mm. even more uh, strenuously anti-Haredi, and they did well at, at, at different, in, in various elections, but it, it was never enough to actually sway an election. Mm. And what Lieberman is trying to do now is he's trying to change the... the, 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 the the shape of the coalition. He's, and, he says, and he's saying two things which are very, very damaging for Netanyahu. He's saying, one, a government with the Haredi parties is not a right-wing government. Like, don't believe what Bibi says to you when this is a natural right-wing coalition. It isn't. It's right-wing parties together with Haredi parties. The Haredi parties have too much power and therefore they're sort of diluting what, could be a, what should be a national right. government. And he's also saying, and more recently, in the last few days, he's saying it's even more interesting. He's saying the coalition we need to build after the election should be a coalition of Likud, Israel, Beitain, and my party, and blue and white. What he's doing here... And that's only a... That, that's, a that's, that's a situation where Netanyahu has to be somehow forced out. He, isn't he saying, it'll by be implication, Likud, it'll be Likud. It be. No, but Lieberman is not saying this is not personal. Yes. I'm happy to sit under Netanyahu, yeah. and I don't think Netanyahu has to resign because of the... You know, he himself right. went through a very long criminal investigation and went on trial. He doesn't think Netanyahu, as he says, Netanyahu doesn't have to resign because of criminal... But we need Likud, and Israel and, and, and blue and white. And what he's done here is very clever because because he's detoxifying blue and white right. as far as Likunix are concerned. Netanyahu's slogan in the last election was blue and white, weak left, yes. Gantz, a bit weak left. And Lira is basically saying, they're not leftists. We can have a national coalition with them. Likud is sort of like soft right, and so are blue and white. Yeah. And, I don't, I, I, and I'm happy to sit with both of them in the coalition. Whoever gets the most votes 
in either party should be the prime minister. And uh, this is really ruining Bibi's, uh, uh, Netanyahu's uh, uh, campaign strategy because first Netanyahu's used to campaigning on one front against mm. one big enemy. That enemy is always tainted as a, as a weak or a dangerous mm. leftist. Now Lieberman's saying, actually, blue and white are okay. Mm-hmm. And he's used to campaigning on one front. Now he's got to campaign against Gantz, who still remains the big, many Gantz remains the leader of the main opposition to Netanyahu. But he's also got to campaign against Lieberman because Lieberman's mm. creating this big problem. And the third thing Lieberman is doing is he's, like you said, toxifying the alliance with the Haredi party. So Netanyahu's entire electoral strategy is being challenged by Lieberman. Yeah. And Lieberman, unlike any other opponent Netanyahu's ever had, knows every trick Netanyahu. You know, he was part of that. And he's not afraid of him. He's, he's happy to take not him on. Af- happy to take him on. He has his own base. He has his own party. He's, he's, not, he's not afraid of the Likud members being angry with him for challenging Netanyahu. Mm. He, he, he really is Netanyahu's nemesis. I'll ask you another question. So I've been in Israel for a couple of days and, uh, and I've had some quite striking conversations with people who voted Likud uh, in April um, who've quite surprised me because they've said they're really angry with what Bibi Netanyahu did since April. They were angry that um, he was so blatant about either trying to bring in a new law to grant him immunity or at least get an immunity vote, also to potentially fiddle around with um, the powers of the Supreme Court to overrule either Knesset, sort of how it deals with people like Bibi who are uh, are facing investigations, or even actually the Supreme Court's powers being limited to actually overturn Knesset laws. And other things as well where people have said they've seen some of these people on the Jewish Home and Jewish Power Party uh, in positions of real influence in politics and that was all Bibi's doing when he sort of match made that, that, that slightly bizarre coalition between Jewish power and Jewish home and it was quite interesting to hear that from Likud voters and them saying oh well, they're not going to vote Bibi again because they were just really appalled by, by what happened so it, do you think there's a real factor there that it's quite rare that people voted for Bibi and then they've seen a glimpse of what that next Netanyahu government would look like and what it would do and how it would prioritise and maybe they don't like it. Are you hearing more about that or do you think that's a real minority? Well, I'm, I'm hearing a similar thing. It's hard to say what size this sort of disappointed Likudnik constituency mm. is. The thing is that we've never had two elections being held so mm. close to each other. We are, we, we have, we're in a situation where people can sort of really think, I, why, remember why they voted Netanyahu in the first place mm. and think, is, the, is that still valid? And it, it, it's, it's, it's sort of natural for an Israeli politician to renege on some of his promises immediately after the election in coalition. That's because the moment you go into a coalition, coalition is a compromise, and mm-hmm. all Israeli governments are coalition go- government. So this immediate disappointment from the, from the party or the leader you've just voted for is inbuilt in the Israeli system. But then you've got two or three years to get over that disappointment, yeah. and then only get worked up about the next session in, in after yes. three or four yeah, years all been spelled it's out. a different kind of psychology yeah. and you know suddenly the you know the disappointment is you know, that we saw you know, if, if you're in a clinic and you saw the Netanyahu reneging on his policy not to look for, not to try and uh, go for an immunity law which he immediately did after the election mm-hmm. if you see Netanyahu said um, that Likud will keep the education ministry not give it to one of the religious parties he's already given it now yeah. to Rafi Peretz because he's trying to keep yeah. you, you, uh, union and right wing parties within his next coalition so the disappointment is very very fresh and that could have an effect either people could change their vote mm. and what we're hearing more and more about from the party strategists who are preparing for this very bizarre campaign mm. they're worried about turnout yes second it, it, it's not just in Israel countries where elections are held after a short period mm. it, it happens it's not, it's not it's rare but it happens it's happened around the world the turnout, always the, lower. turnout is almost always lower yeah. and it could uh, because the big party and it's Netanyahu's party could be could be especially vulnerable mm. to that We've got an added element. Well. We've got an added element as well, haven't we? Where it, it's really odd to have an election that really goes into its final phase right at the point where everyone's on holiday. So you've got this. You know, the party lists are going to be handed in and finalised in the early August period, where where really everything's. Uh, slowed down almost completely. Uh, do you think that's going to mean a very bizarre sort of frenetic, 
burst of activity in sort of very late August, early September. It will almost be concentrated in those final weeks. It, it, certainly, will, it certainly will be there. I mean, to remember that, that that's not necessarily that odd because the large, major, large proportion of the population start paying attention to elections anyway in the last few weeks but this is israel a lot more it's a, it's a, it's a much more politically engaged mm. society than most western countries are mm. so yes it is you know israelis do pay attention to politics more than in other countries so it is sort of different in the sense that you know we've got august which is almost a dead month here in mm. israel and then we've got two and a half weeks and then the election and immediately after the chagim mm. so the whole this like period of between rosh hashanah and the end of the summer holidays in which is going to be a very very intense political period and it's and, and it's difficult it was, once again you, you hear it from the strategists who are starting starting to plan how to work this election it is difficult to plan such an election i think in britain it's much more commonplace that the really intense campaigning only happens and the campaigns in, are very short I mean, yeah it's a very, very short also yeah. in britain you have a snap election yes. people are calling this a snap it's not a snap election yes. by british terms we know the elections were caught two weeks ago and we still have more than three months to go so this is not a snap election you know english listeners who are hearing israel having a snap election could think the election will be, will be in two weeks no yeah. there's still three more months but in israeli terms this is a short campaign yeah, yeah. and it's become a, a, and really no I, I don't remember at least not in in the, the decades i've been paying attention i don't remember a september election sort of stuck between mm. between the summer holidays and and and, and, and the high between the summer holidays and the high holidays mm. it's i mean everything here is unprecedented and we've got all in the mix the fact that Everybody's aware that two weeks after the election, the Finial's pre-trial hearing will be mm. held. Every, the, the mix has, mm, there's a lot of factors. Uh, is, is bizarre. We, we know what Abidor Lieberman's up to. We know we know that Bibi's going to be the leader of the Kurd. But there's a lot of other people that we don't know about. We know that Gantz is going to lead Blue and White, but but we don't know. There's a few other parties. What, what, what do you think else we should be looking out for? There's a couple of other things that you would say listeners should really look out for that could potentially change the the election. Well. I think I said before the turnout is going to be a key mm. matter here because the way that seats are allocated, the turnout has a huge mm. impact. So, if, for example, Likud's turnout will go down and the Arab parties may stage a comeback because mm. their turnout was very low in, on, yeah. on April 9. And they, one of the things that's going to happen there is that the joint list, the joint Arab list will almost certainly reunite the list that they had in 2015 because earlier this year they, they split into two mm. which which punished them they went down to they, they lost three of their seats i think that turnout will probably be higher there so that changes the entire balance of the seats yeah and against Likud, and that's one thing that we should be looking out at we'll probably almost certainly have a new labor leader because avi gabez resigned so we have the labor will be holding in a few weeks of party-wide primaries and quite likely a new merits leader as well uh tamar zambeg is uh, the current merits leader is running mm. but uh, her prospects against uh, nitsan horowitz who's now challenging her that there'll be a merits convention to to elect a new leader her chances are not great so we'll probably have nitsan horowitz and a new leader in labor it could be it's a it could be amir peretz maybe steph shafir and they will probably work out a way to combine you know, to join forces for this election they've both been so badly mauled mm. in in this this year's first election they're, they're down to 10 seats together merits and labor they'll stick together this time more no, for no certain form of actual alliance. i don't know if there'll be a lasting alliance but mm. at least there'll be a one-off for this, election. for this election to try and regain some of the seats they've lost so what we what what we probably will see is some growth in the center left plus the arab list block because they'll, they'll probably do better on turnout this time mm. and they'll lose less seats because they'll be more more united the big question is can the Likud hold on to it to its gains from the last election hold you know, sort of motivate the voters and he has been very good at motivating his voters at the last moment in previous elections this time it's going to be an even bigger even higher hurdle than it usually is for really good that's the really big question um Anshul Pfeffer, thank you so much we, we've covered uh, all the major issues there and no doubt we'll be talking again uh, before this uh, very long campaign season is over. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope, I, hope you, I, I hope you've still got a summer holiday to look forward to with, <laughs> with all this electioneering on the way. Absolutely. Thank you very much. <laughs>